All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue to talk about um, the sexuality of, that you have given to us and, and the way in which you wish us to uh, live out our lives in that manner in the context of marriage between a man and a woman, a blessing that you intend for all. Uh, we ask your blessing on our discussion today as we talk about some of the practical applications of the Sixth Commandment that many of us have probably experienced in one way or another in our lives personally or know somebody who has. Help us to speak with compassion, but also faithfulness to your word so that we may be a blessing that you intend for their to be in their lives so that they may, like us, come to know you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So last week, as per usual, you guys asked some great questions, so we only got about halfway through our sheets, um, and so we're going to be talking about some of the applications of the Sixth Commandment, uh, which I'm not going to assume we're going to get through, um, because uh, we usually have some really great discussion and necessary discussion, especially about some of these topics. Um, they're very relevant to our day. There's a lot of very confusing knowledge out there that's being taught to everyone, but most especially to kids about sexuality and what is good and proper. And so um, if you want to turn in your catechisms to page 98, that's where we're going to be starting. Um, and we're going to be starting with connections and applications. So just for your own benefit, if you've got one of the catechisms, when you're studying this, if you want to do anything on your own, each one of the sections for like the commandments or the parts of the creed, at the end, there'll be a connections and applications section. And that really digs into many of the questions that you would assume needed to be asked about. So like, for example, the sixth commandment, this is where you're going to find stuff about, well, what does the church of the Bible say about single people? What does the church of the Bible say about homosexuality? What does it say about transsexuality? Um, and what does it say about cohabitation? Because those are usually the questions that people ask in one way or another when you're going over the sixth commandment. So those are going to be the questions we're going to look at today. We got a little bit into the homosexuality question last week, um, and we'll, so we won't spend as much time on that this week, uh, but we're going to look at some of these as well. All right, so question number 71 on page 98, what does the Bible affirm about people who are not married? Our identity, work, or completeness as human beings is not determined by our marital status, but by our creator and redeemer, okay? Um, so this is probably written in response to, there are many people in my generation and maybe the generation above who felt like the church always sort of treated them as less than because they didn't get married. So if they were 35 and single, they felt like the church didn't really minister to them. And would you say that in some cases they probably had a valid concern? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Think about the typical programs at a church. If you're 35 and single and you have no children, there's usually not a lot offered there for you. And so it can lead you to think that, well, maybe the church is really trying to push me into this marriage track because if, in order to feel like a full-fledged Christian, I need to get married. Right? The Bible does not teach that. And so we, we have to be careful, too, practically speaking, in our churches that we don't create that impression for Young adults, because uh, who is somebody that wrote a lot of the New Testament that never got married? Paul, Paul right? So, and he talks about the benefit of being single in the Christian context is that you have more time to focus on serving God. Right? Um, he doesn't say one is better or worse than the other. Um, his, he gives his personal take on it, but he doesn't say that as a prescriptive thing, but just a descriptive thing for him. Okay, um, but right out of the gate. We're going to be clear that because you're married and you have children does not mean that you're more valued by God. Okay. All right. Letter A. God made us stewards of his creation, whether single or married. So we're going to read Genesis 1, 27 to 28, uh, which is there in the, on the page for you on page 98. Well, let's see. Ron, you want to read that for us? Okay. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea 
and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female, he created them. All right, so it doesn't equate marriage to being made in the image of God. All right, you're made in the image of God from the get-go, male and female. Okay? So that one's, that's talking about there. So when God created Adam and then he said he needed a helper, right? Okay. Yes. So he created Eve. Yep. So they weren't really married, per se, or is, or is that incorrect to say that? No, we would say that they were married. They were married um, by God? Like, <laughs> through, through the establishing of their relationship, we would say that that was, like, the in, instituting of, of the estate of marriage. Okay. Um, but what was not good isn't specifically identified as, like, a sexual relationship. What was not good was that man was alone. In other words... Uh, some people extrapolate this back to the image of God that, um, like it, it, in this verse itself, actually, look at, oh, it's like the verse before, God says to himself, let us make man in our own image, okay? And so that's the Holy Trinity. And so part of what we would say is we think that being made in the image of God includes we're relational beings, just like God is three in one, right? And so... That's why it was described as not good that man was alone. Right? And you'll notice at first, where does he look to find a helper? Man. All the other animals, right? Man. He goes around and, and names the animals and, and is searching for a helper, right? And so it's it's a base, more of a base level relationship. And, and then of course when Eve comes, it is it is it ends up becoming a marriage relationship. Yeah. Right. In a true faith-based marriage, it is a threesome. You've got the husband, the wife. And God. Right. Yep. Yeah. When you are when you're giving your marriage vows to one another, you're giving them in the presence of God um, as well. So he's included in that relationship. Oh yeah. That is your question. Okay. And the promise is not to your uh spouse at the altar. That promise is to God. Well, it's to both. Right. You're making a vow um to them and to God. Right, and, and as a means of, of proving that that's what you're going to actually do, because it's a commitment based thing rather than a romantic inclination thing. Okay, letter B God has given all good things to all Christians, whether single or married. Uh, Romans 8 32 He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Right, so. When God talks about his provision in Jesus, he never specifies that this is only for people who get married and have children, right? It's a blanket statement of gracious blessing. Now, some of this seems obvious to you probably, but this is important that you be specifically say because you never know when people are feeling like because they're single, they're being sort of dismissed in a church. Because we, we, as we have a tendency to think organizationally, so if you have a visitor come into your church, just to give you an example, and it's a, someone like me, right? Single 31 year old guy comes in and, well, not fully single anymore, but um, single 31 year old guy, right? Walk in and you might be like, oh, cool, there's a young person here, but that's pretty much the extent of the thought. What if it's like a family like the Blakes, right? mom and dad and three kids and you're just like jumping for joy right so that can create an impression that that is more valuable to you than the other person right so that's that's one of the reasons why we want to explicitly mention this so that we're thankful for all of the people who are part of our body of christ here at Central church and make sure that they understand and feel that way as well all right let us see God calls unmarried persons to live in contentment as they trust in him and serve their neighbor. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about this. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. And then later on in that same chapter, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. 
Okay. So Paul, <clears throat> and this is where we're always describing both of these states as a gift. Right. So Paul was given the gift of celibacy. Right? He wasn't somebody who was impassioned with lust. And so he lived a life, a single life. And some people, you maybe know someone like that. Some people are like that. Um, but that's a gift. We describe that as, from the scriptures as a gift. Because Paul, after Paul makes a lot of these exhortations, he says, but not everyone is as I am. Right? So, uh, and then he goes on to say, if you are passionate for the opposite sex, then you should get married and be able to carry that passion out into the opposite life. Right? And it also is in tandem with what we just read, what Ron just read in, in Genesis, right? What is God's command for the human beings in creation to be fruitful and multiply? So don't read that and think that Paul is saying being married is bad, right? He's highlighting like there's different spiritual benefits to both the states. Does that make sense? Okay. We don't know what Paul was like before he had his <laughs> conversion of Jesus. Because he was a very rich man, right? From a good family. Yeah. And so maybe his life was completely different than then. Because he was killing people. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, so there's never any indication in the scriptures, though, that he was ever, ever really interested in even prior to like while he was Saul prior to becoming Paul he was still very full of zeal just the wrong source for the wrong thing and so he's always been described scripturally speaking as someone who's dedicated you know been called really to dedicate their life to the pursuit of God uh, and there are some people like that of course he, he wrote almost the entire New Testament so He's going to write, you're not going to write things in that he doesn't want people to know. Right? Well, <laughs> and, and really, he like, out all of those, you know, little, the seemly stories. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, the stuff that's going to be included is the stuff that God intended to be yeah. beneficial to us. So if it's not included, then we don't really need to know about it. Um, so, speculation, that, like, in general, speculation is a lot of fun, uh, but it can also, like, don't get too crazy with it because you, know, you don't want to venture too far into territory that you're not really sure about. Okay, and then letter D, people will not be married in the age to come after Jesus returns. So in Matthew 22, Jesus says, for the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So this was in, in response to, partially in response to the question about, that I think Rob brought up last week, where they were trying to trick Jesus by saying, well, what if there was this woman who her original husband died and her husband's brother marries her and she outlooks him and his his other brother marries her, and he outlives her, and you know, and all this stuff. And so he said, when he gets to heaven, who, who is going to be her husband? Right. Um, and so Jesus, of course, gives a much more detailed explanation of that specific question, but in summation, he says this statement about heaven. Right. So this is after Jesus comes back and we're all raised. Yes. He says, in the resurrection. So I don't know if I want to get into this right now, but <laughs> first, you die. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm confused about that. Well, there were there were like three people that specifically asked a question about at the beginning when I was asking for like what's something you want to make sure we cover in the class was how exactly does it work with do I die and then I wait you know sleeping essentially until the day of judgment or am I like what about when Jesus says to the the thief on the cross truly I say to you today you'll be with me in paradise and all that. So we will get into that in detail when we get to the creed. So, so if you're not on that, but um, that'll take us way too far afield and we won't even get to the next question if we start talking about it today. Um, you know about the rapture. No, <laughs> no Pete. Okay. Any, any other questions about kind of the, the subject of single versus married and the way that we are to approach those two states. I know it's different when you talk because Paul's talking about in the church how things could be, but there's the life outside the church. And I do think society views single people different than married people. Now, having been both ways, 
I mean, single. Haven't <laughs> <laughs> been single, married. I'm so been sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what I meant by this that. is where I get it all. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm following you around. Everybody else, maybe. Everybody else is fine, but like Mike's. <laughs> so uh, I, I noticed a difference. Seriously. Yeah. When I was first single, it didn't matter because I was single. And then I got married, and that was great. And then I'm single again. And I can notice being with married couples. Oh, it's, it's awkward sometimes. Sure. Yeah. It really is. And, and you just walk in the store, and you're a single man shopping or something. And people, especially ones with married with kids, oh, good and all that, got to come near a little kid. Right. Yeah. No, and so the uh, Ron brought up the point that there's, you know, Paul's talking about in the context of the church, but there's yeah. there's out in the world, there seems to be a difference between the way people perceive you as a married person versus uh, a single person. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that's what we're trying to address with this teaching in the church, right, is that the Bible does not make such worth distinctions. Because I totally get what you're saying. Like, I moved to Ohio as a single guy who was also a pastor. So, Pastors in, in many people's minds are not like that's not a positive, it's an off putting thing. And not only that, but I'm single and I, and I live in my own house. So it, it's a little extra difficult to get to know your neighbors in a non creepy way. Seriously, because most people have that impression of you. Like if I walked up to your house like this and I was your neighbor, like most people are going to, like it's not going to be like a normal interaction. They're going to be like guarded right from the get go. Right. Um, <laughs> and, depend, and depending on their personal experience, it may be justified. Right. But I, like, until I got a dog, I think it was very difficult for me to strike up conversations with random people in my neighborhood without, without what you're saying, without feeling like people were sort of like, who's this guy? Why is he alone? It's like, because I, I don't know. I live by myself. I cut me some slack, you know. Um, but there is that different in, difference in perception. So we're not we're not saying that that doesn't exist, but we're saying scripturally speaking, it has no basis, right? Um, and so we need to resist the desire to make those distinctions, right? So we we want to create a space here where a single person walks in, like people aren't grabbing their kids and holding them closer, mm -hmm. kind of thing, or even just sort of they like don't know how to approach them and it's awkward because well i have kids so i've got a bunch of kids stuff to talk about what do i talk about with a single 27 year old right um and then they'll immediately feel like like even and they, they may even understand to a certain degree they might be like oh well i get that they don't know what to say to me but the fact that nobody's even trying to makes me not want to come back right Th those are the sorts of interactions that that either cause people to return or not return right um, the, the other aspect of that that I wanted to highlight before we moved on was most people then, they hear that from somebody they care about and then they decide that it's never good to encourage somebody to get married. That's also wrong. Okay? Um, and if it's somebody that you care about that's responded that way, dig a little bit. Find out why they're upset that you're asking for that. Because maybe they have a false understanding of why you're saying that. Maybe you're just saying because. I just want you to be happy. That's the only reason I'm saying it. And they may think that you're trying to push them into something because you feel like they're incomplete or unhappy now. And then maybe you're trying to say, I'm, I'm happy with my life right now. Right? Um, so it's important to not go too far either direction. Because sometimes the response goes too far as well, where people then try to feel like it's wrong to encourage people to marry. It's not wrong to do that. That may be God's plan for them. But I'm always talking about it in the context of you know, if it's God's will that you don't get married, that's totally fine, and I'm perfectly happy about that. But if it is his will to get married, then it's also fine, and you shouldn't resist that either. And right? so resisting in either direction would be would be incorrect. Not only for the person encouraging, but also the person questioning. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else before we go on to question 72 on page 99? All right, we're on the middle of page 99 in Catechism, question 72. What is the Christian view of living together apart from marriage? So I have done five weddings. 
How many of those weddings do you think the people getting married were living together when I started speaking with them? Oh. All of them. Oh, really? Oh. And most of them, I had two that were sort of, they were fringe as far as their, their faith goes. Their, their families were very faithful, and they were sort of faithful. But the other three grew up in the church, still active in the church, but living together. Right? So this is a very common thing. And maybe some of you have experienced this in, within the context of your own family. Um, or among friends. I had friends that I grew up with that started living together with girlfriends and boyfriends and things like that. Okay. God's will for our lives is violated in several ways when a man and woman live together in a sexual relationship without being married. Cohabitation fails to honor God, honor God's gift of marriage. Okay, so and I'll just start by saying, in pairing with the doctrine of original sin and the understanding of the temptation in particular of sexual sin, the assumption that I will make if somebody comes to me and they say they're living together is that they're sexually active, okay? Because it's really just sort of, if you don't want to be sexually active, it's it's at base level super unwise to live together, um, but it's also unrealistic at, after a certain point, okay? Um, not saying it can't happen, but I don't know why, if that was your goal, you would put yourself in such a situation. Like okay. The assumption is cohabitation means that you're sexually active. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, okay. This is Kristen. I have a uh, hypothetical. Okay. Um, 85 year old couple um, wants to live together um, and Christian, um, but for legal and estate planning reasons, um, they maybe it's a second marriage um, or a second, they're widowed or um, had um, a divorce. And so they're a couple, Christian couple, 85 years old, wants to live together, but not get married for legal tax reasons. Um, you know, what do you think about that? So I would say there's, so we've gotten so used to the official act of the church of marriage being so intimately tied with the legal. Right. Because the, there's a, there's a difference between legal marriage and, and a, a church marriage. Yes. So in that situation, I would encourage a church marriage because I think what matters, even, even with the extenuating tax circumstances, and I don't know exactly. And estate planning with kids from prior marriages, you know. Um, and I don't know exactly the, the legal detail as far as if they would be forced into a legal recognition if they had a church marriage. Um, but They're... I would encourage, and maybe some more of our, our legal minds here can answer that question, but I would say with my current level of knowledge about that situation, I would encourage a church marriage. And there really is no need to make it legally binding in an earthly sense. Well, in order for them to not be sinning against God. I mean, I, I think I, to, to have a church marriage, you need a, uh, a marriage certificate that you get through the government. So it's legal. Well, if you make it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> Wasn't there at one point in time kind of a, a right that the church had where? essentially people who were I don't know like it was it was it was kind of like a lifelong commitment type right it wasn't it wasn't necessarily marriage but it was sort of um I remember reading about this in terms of like uh, of people that didn't have spouses but essentially the same sort of familial structure to take care of, you know to promise to take care of each other I yeah. mean, it, like the like, if you do a church wedding in the standard way that you would normally, it does have to involve the legal side of things with the marriage certificate and all of that. But that's all for the benefit of the state, right? Um, so, I mean, I could, I haven't thought about this in great detail, like this particular example. Um, so I'd have to do that before acting on it, but 
I'm, Sorry. I would think that there wouldn't be any reason why I couldn't do a wedding like that without those things. If the if the goal is not to change the legal marital status of the to 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 put them in the estate of holy marriage, because the, we've tied those together in our country, but. I mean, there are currently many countries around the world where if you get married in a Christian church, you're not going to be legally necessarily recognized. Yeah. Where in the Bible does it say that you're not married unless you have a church marriage? So that's a good question. So the question was, where does it say in the Bible that you're not legally, you're not married unless you have a church marriage? For example, the, Jesus in his encounter with the, with the woman at the well suggested that she had had many husbands, right? Yeah. But I don't suspect that she had had many married husbands. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think that that was the implication. Sure. She was living in sin, right? Right. But so, um, so I guess the first question I would ask in response to that question would be, what What do you mean by church marriage? So some people think church marriage is just in a church building. But you can have a non-church marriage in a church building. Many people do. Well, um, so for example, couples that are living together yeah. and are in a committed relationship, is that not marriage? As as that the state is recognized in, in, in the Christian faith. We would say no. Why is that? That's because so you even use the phrase they're in a loving, committed relationship. We would say they're not in a committed they haven't made that commitment to each other. Cool. And so the, the the church part of that commitment is, as Rob was pointing out before, that it isn't just a, like a, a commitment agreement between you and your, your, your potential spouse. It is between you and your spouse and God. Right? Where, where in the Bible does it say? I'm getting there. I'm just okay. establishing, yeah. you know, what, what we would say. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, so... The Bible, where does the Bible say that a pastor ought to baptize your children? It doesn't, right? So why do we do that? Tradition, okay, that's one argument. That's what we've always done. Yeah. To make sure the one performing the service. Okay, so to uh, maintain the proper integrity and purpose. Or the, the right. Uh, so typically, that would be one of our arguments for it, yeah, but we would usually express it in terms of like, for the sake of good order, right? So God instituted the church. Like, could somebody conceivably be saved without being formally a part of like a earthly church? Of course, right? Would we ever encourage them to live a life apart from the church? No. Why? For the sake of good work right? and for their well-being. Because God has instituted these sorts of things. It's the same reason we, we do the sacraments the way we do, right? Is God's promise to be present in, in a particular place for a particular purpose. And our job as the church, as a steward of those gifts, those blessings, is to try and maintain them as faithfully as possible for as long as so in the same way that if if baptisms like if if a dad does an emergency baptism for a baby that has been born and they're not sure how long he's going to live, is that a valid baptism? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course, it is, right? Um, so why do people have pastors do that mostly? It's so that over a long period of time, right? We we usually think of these terms in in terms of single lifetime, you know, just like you know a matter of seven or eight decades. But the church has to think about this stuff for thousands of years, right? So if you start diluting out those practices to be done in any sort of manner or context, you know, you have 1,500 years in the future, and it's probably going to be, like, have you ever played the telephone pictionary? The game where you get a little note cards, and somebody writes a phrase, and then everybody passes theirs to the left, and then the next person has to try and draw a picture of the phrase. And then they, they pass to the left again, and the following person looks at the picture and has to write the phrase again. And by the time you get your card back, you maybe drew a picture of Taco Bell, and the last phrase written about it is like a platypus in a paddle boat. Right? Like it's a totally different thing. 
So the for the sake of good order in the church argument is to avoid that reality over a long period of time. So it doesn't totally discount the idea that maybe the particular couple or person you're talking about in question really does understand the purpose of the right. But it's still, from our perspective, not a good idea to do it in that manner unless absolutely necessary in order to preserve that over a long period of time. Because it's also, these are all public things too, right? So they're bearing witness to the what God has done. Yeah, Pete. Also, in, in, in piggybacking on what you said, somebody can graduate from seminary at some point in their life. And the or ordination of, of a pastor is basically the community at large and the, the, um, the denomination at large saying, we have full faith and trust in this person. It, it's, it's like having a major certificate saying approved for doing these things. Right, right. So he was making the point that you can graduate from the seminary but not be ordained. What an ordination does is it tells the church at large that you're going to serve that this person is knowledgeable and trustworthy to carry out the office to which you call them, right? And really that's the same in most professions, right? You're not going to let somebody be your lawyer unless they're legally qualified to be one, or you're not going to let somebody operate on you unless they're an actual doctor. Like if I should be like, well, I got a education at the seminary so i'm going to perform heart surgery on you like uh you're a crazy person please step away right um and so that's where, where that comes from like if you're in a you know desert island situation and there's no institutional church around and you fall in love with another person on a desert island and you you know do a faithful wedding ceremony in the sense that you're you're making your vows not just to each other but to god to to love in an unconditional fashion then I would say that that's probably a legit marriage from a Christian perspective. The chimpanzees as a witness. <laughs> <laughs> your wedding party will be chimpanzees and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so because um, that that really is a bugaboo for a lot of people, right? They uh, and it's usually in response to like why why do there have to be so many rules about it? Um, and I usually respond to those sorts of questions with questions. Like you're making a lifelong commitment to somebody. Why, why are these tiny rules a big deal? Like you're entering into a relationship where the name of the game is denial of self. And yet you want to start it off by making a bunch of selfish demands to gratify your own wants and needs, right? And so just helping people see that this is actually meant to be a blessing the way we do this for you and for those who bear witness to what's going to, going to happen. I'm not meant to put extra barriers in place. Right? Because uh, you can make the same thing about, uh, like I was told my female friends when I was growing up, when I got to a certain age and they started getting engaged, I was told it should be a big red flag to you if the guy you want to get married to does not want to talk to somebody about your marriage prior to getting married. Because whatever's going to come up in that conversation is going to come up in your marriage. So he's not going to bring up anything new. It's not like it's going to create new problems. right? Um, and so... Why do you want to encourage couples to do that? Well, it's not to put another rule and another barrier in place prior to their marriage. It's so that they go in with both eyes open with a proper understanding of what marriage is for their benefit. So like when I do premarital's, if you're living together, I ask you if possible to not during the duration of the time we're meeting. And if for financial reasons, because in some cases people have put in together in a way that there really is no option for them to live somewhere else financially. Then I ask them to sexually separate during that time. Because if you're going to be doing this in the way God intends, we got to go by his way. Right? But I start my whole, all my sessions by establishing that everything I'm going to talk with you about, everything that I'm going to bring up with you and ask of you is for your benefit. Because I want you to have a great marriage. I want you to have a long marriage. And usually they agree with me and that that's what they want as well. And so I say that everything we're going to talk about is to that end. Right. And so I try to get people to see that the, like the order and rule of the church when it comes to things like weddings is for that. It's not make it's not meant to just make things unnecessarily complicated. It's not to put up barriers. It's actually to increase the potential blessing of what God intends us to be for you. Which is a blessing. Yeah, Mike. Does the church view 
Muslims or Hindus who are married as married? So the question was, does the church view Muslims and Hindus as married, are they, uh, as actually married? Yeah, if they're not, if they're married, quote unquote, I mean, legally, of course, they're married, but outside the Christian faith, sure. are they viewed as married people or single? I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the church's view on that? So I would say that that would depend on the particulars of the situation in some ways, but largely the church would consider them married. So we, we have an example from scripture where um, I can't remember which Pauline letter it is, but he talks about like you should, if that, it's not grounds for divorcing your husband or wife. If you become a Christian, they're not. Right. So there's an understanding there that the, the prior relationship that's been established outside of the faith is honored. Okay. Um, but for example, like we have such a, a particular view of what it means to be married. So if it's like radically different than that, then you wouldn't necessarily say that you, you're not married, you have to get a divorce or you have to separate. But we need to, like as part of your like conversion to faith, we need to talk about your relationship with your significant other and help bring it in line with God's picture of what that's meant to be. And that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do another marriage ceremony, but I would want to meet with them and present to them God's intention and picture of marriage, or once again, for their benefit and blessing going forward. I'm not sure I understand that. We talked about homosexuality, right? Yeah. And how the church does not view gay marriage, right? As yeah. Marriage. But I don't understand what the difference between two Muslims who are not Christian at all. Sure getting married, what's the difference between them getting married and two men getting married? Okay, so um, the question other was, than, what's the difference between the, thing, right? the, the like two not unbelieving Muslims getting married and, and two men getting married in a gay relationship? Um, so what's I sort of misunderstood thing? your initial question yeah. as like, if somebody was coming into the church, would their marriage be recognized even if it occurred outside of the church? Is that how do we view them? I mean, they... so if we're just saying, how do we view them? Yeah. Um, so it's important to note one that marriage is not viewed as like a salvific thing, right? So it's not a sacrament for us, um, which we established earlier. We talked about single versus married. So we don't really particularly have a lot at play for unbelievers' marriages. Right, because if they're unbelievers and they got married and they're not following God's law, it sort of makes sense, right? They don't believe it. Um, it is if it's just an outsider perspective, like we're here in the church and we're looking out, it would be the same for homosexual marriage, right? It would be, I mean, there are non believers, so it makes sense to me that they don't follow God's law or his picture for marriage. I personally wouldn't call that marriage, but legally, if it's called marriage. It doesn't really matter to the church. Okay? I mean, you can make arguments from natural law that it's bad for society over a long period of time and all that stuff, but from a theological perspective of the church, it isn't our prerogative to go around saying you're disgusting and horrible and evil and your marriage is blah. Because we would just say personally, we don't call it marriage because that's not what God says marriage is. We would say it's the same for the unbelievers' relationship as well, although we don't typically say that because it's not not usually the primary connection to why you're even thinking about it. So that's some of the difference with the homosexual union is that's like an obvious primary connection as to why you're even thinking about it in the first place is the sexual orientation piece. But in the same way that if they were coming into the church, they would have to cease that relationship. It would be uh, like in their case, it would be because the basis of their togetherness in that context is wrong from scripture. So we would say, if the homosexual couple wants to become Christian, they would have to legally divorce. And we would say that it's not really like spiritually a divorce because it wasn't a marriage to begin with. And then they would have to turn away from that lifestyle. Right? In the case of the uh, Muslim couple, there may be other aspects of their marriage that they do need to turn away from for the exact same reason. For them, maybe it's not the sexual thing. Maybe they have the same understanding of that as we do from Scripture. 
but maybe it's the role of the husband and wife that's that's wrong. And then as part of their coming into the Christian faith, their understanding of marriage has to shift and it would go away from those things. And they would be asked to turn away from that understanding. So it is, principally, it is the same. Yeah. It's just less obvious in one case than the other two. And less, people do get really hung up on the sexual orientation stuff in a way that they don't get hung up on the other stuff. So it, it, it gets magnified, like societally speaking, but theologically, the principle is the same thing. Great question. Do you take into account ceremonial law, civil law versus moral law? It's easier to, to work it. Yeah, right. That we're so the, the point was made that if you take into account, if you remember we talked a while back about the difference between civil law, ceremonial law, and moral law, it's easier to kind of parse some of these things out. Uh, Pete and then Trish. So taking back off Mike's question, the celestial realm let's say we had a non-Christian married couple who came to the Lord and decided to, to start coming to church. Are you saying we would not recommend that they recommit their vows in front of God in our church? It depends. So th this is where like, I wouldn't say that there's a hard rule that applies in all cases. You know, because you could have a couple that is aware of those things. And when they became Christian, one of the things they thought was, well, my marriage is one of my primary human relationships, and I'm sure the Bible has something to say about that. Let's learn about that. And then they may come in already wanting to move in that direction. And then they may say, and, and this, uh, this could easily happen, come in and say, Pastor, we're new to Christianity. We've been married for 15 years. Neither of us were Christian before. We'd love to chat with you about what, what does it mean to be in a Christian relationship in the context of marriage? And I'd be happy to do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'd have to do something formal. And once again, I would say it's all for their benefit. So if I have a couple, let's say, that wants to do a sort of renewal of their vows in the context of their, their newfound Christian faith, I would not dissuade them from it. Right? I would, I would say that you're not really like getting a new marriage here, but you're, you're refocusing your relationship on as God intended it to be, right? Uh, and that would probably, in most cases, I would say that's probably going to be a private thing between them. It might just be them and me. It might be them and some of their children or their close, close relatives and that sort of thing. But yeah, good question. Uh, Trish. Well, getting back to this couple, Kristen talked about saying five-year-old yeah. couple. Yeah. Why can't they, if they can do this on a desert island between two people and God, sure. why can't these two people do it? Well, because they're not on a desert island. Well, I know. <laughs> but so but so the, the desert, the purpose of the desert island hypothetical is you're providing a space where they literally have no other option. In this case, they have plenty of other options. And so uh, in the case that, that Kristen brought up, which is a, a is one I've been asked about before, you do have like valid concerns, but you should still exercise your options and seek out the options available to you in order to, like if you're going to have a sexual relationship, it's in your best interest, far more best interest for you, by the way, than how much money your children get is, should I be living in an unrepentant manner? near the time of my death, right? I'm, far, I'm much more concerned about something like that than I am about the, the ins and outs of the legal drama regarding wills and other things well, like that. Well, I, I, I agree with that, but I mean, couldn't there be some way to have like a blessing ceremony or something that these people really would definitely make this commitment in front of God and to God and with God except for these legal issues they can't get around. I mean, that's sort of what my answer was. Oh, yeah. That you would do that you would do a like a church recognized ceremony that's not necessarily legally binding. Because like when uh, marriages were happening throughout different times in the Christian church, they weren't necessarily also recognized by the country they were occurring in. That's still true in many places today. Can, can you have the reverse? So let's say in the Christian scenario and this happens. I, I've been asked on yeah. more times 
in my last five years about couples seeking to get divorced for financial purposes, right? They're, they, they're still in a committed relationship. Oh, interesting. Typically, right, when people, Christian, a Christian couple would get divorced, or at least as it relates to the Lutheran church, and I, maybe I, I'm not familiar with it, they're considered divorced for all purposes, not just legally. Yeah. So can you get divorced legally, but remain married in the eyes of the church? Wow. <laughs> I mean, so I would say that, like, technically that could be possible, right? So because it does, I mean, it, it really happens. I mean, sure. Yeah. Happens. No, I, I can totally see yeah. where that would occur. So I think this would once again go back to the messy nature of, for the sake of good order, and not only like our order, but I'm talking about like for future generations. Um, that is quite confusing for people who hear about it, right? So um, it could be helpful for me to know. Because, <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I, I, you know, I, I would say I don't not have faith conversations with people that I know if they're Christian, right? I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to preach to them, but if, if that's part of the conversation that they welcome, I'll certainly engage in that, right? You know, with them, if, if in, and it would be a comfort to them if I could say, you know, you can get divorced legally, but under the in the eyes of the church, you'll still be considered married. But that might be a real comfort to them. I just I never thought about it that way, but sure. You see what I mean? Why? I, I don't understand the question. Why? Why would somebody? There, there's some. It sounds like a financial loophole. I mean, is this like moving your assets to the Cayman Islands? I mean, yeah, is a broader ethical well, question well, about yeah, what we're doing. Or that would make sense. Well, it, it's because it typically happens when, it, for financial purposes, it, in elderly couples, because there's a filial support statute in Pennsylvania that requires spouses to support one another yeah. and if one spouse is, needs very expensive care mm -hmm. right it mm -hmm. can be financially devastating on the spouse that is living in the community right so i'll say in particular it happened with one spouse who was a physician the husband was too but he was a spendthrift and he he was you know, perhaps having some mental issues but he was spending all of his money and he was going to be needing care at some point along the way. And in order to qualify for certain government benefits, you can only have so many resources. You have to spend them down. And she did not want to get stuck in that spend down situation. Mm -hmm. And this is not unusual. This is not unusual. Um, and you know, you, you have it for <laughs> social security retirement planning and lots of different that people are becoming more aware of, right? And they're making these financial decisions. So, so it's interesting. I would say like in the general the general issue at play with an example like that would be um, you're talking like when we're talking about the, the the life of unrepentance or repentant faith. You're talking about things far beyond financial hardship and even earthly good. So at base level, that has to be a primary concern in these conversations where, you know, is, is this decision going to have a much deeper spiritual impact than any future possible financial problems that may occur, right? And if the answer to that is yes, then it should not be done, right? Um, and maybe not even just for you, but maybe if it's going to cause some serious spiritual harm for your children, that, that they're going to be very... You know, this, this would get into the territory where Paul's talking about eating food sacrificed to idols, that for the sake of not causing a stumbling block in the faith for, for other believers, that's reason enough not to do whatever you're asking them to do. Right? I, think, I think the church has allowed legal marriage and Christian marriage to be so commingled. In fact, they've advocated for that yeah. in fighting against certain types of marriage that, that they've created... They've given up to some extent ownership, yes. right, of marriage, and now with all of these other things happening, the church is, I think, going to have to deal with the implications of that. Because right. most people would not say, if I get divorced 
in downtown at the Court of Common Pleas, but I can still be married, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. it might cause spiritual damage, but only because the church has allowed this commingling belief to persist. Sure. Or but, advocate. but that's the exact same you know I mean? problem that Paul has as well, yeah. right? Is it, it, there isn't actually anything wrong with eating meat sacrificed to idols. Right. So that isn't the, that isn't the thing in question. It is whether or not it's correct or not, it's causing spiritual harm for someone else. Right. And so, you know, you could say maybe over time you can convince that person that it isn't, and then you would be free to do whatever you're asking about. But I think Partly because of that co-mingling, which whether once again whether it's right or not, I would I would tend to agree with you that I think the church has given up its ownership of, of the institution of marriage in pursuit of that legal union um, with the state. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, some are good, you know, some are better than others. Um, that the question still is a is ultimately a spiritual one, right? So, like with Kristen's example, with your example, it would still be like your spiritual state of being and your spouses is a far more concern in the context of marriage because now you're not talking about marriage just in a legal sense, but in a total sense, right? Um, now, it's hard to answer that question in a vacuum because there's so many different, different yeah. circumstances. It's, but it's an interesting comment. It is, it is an interesting comment. I'll have to think about that some more. Good question, yeah. Pastor, I had a friend as an elderly couple and uh, they moved in, they uh, bought a house, and moved in together, but they weren't married. And she was having, you know, thought, but she didn't want to marry because she had heart problems and a lot of medical problems. And they, when they bought the house, they put it on his name. And she didn't want to marry because he'd be responsible for all her medical bills. And so, you know, at first, you don't know which way to think of it, you know? She passed away and she's gone, but he ended up taking care of her. And she said numerous times, if it wasn't for him, she'd be in a nursing home. And sure. he took care of her five, six years before she passed. And it was really a lot of medical problems. So these, these, these examples and questions are all kind of coming up along the same lines. And I have to yeah. admit, I will, I'll have to do some research and, and talk to a few people because I don't know the exact right answer off the bat given every circumstance. And I do want to get on to another topic. Um, so I'll come back to you when we bring this up again, um, which may be next week or so. Um, because the other the other thing that we got to talk about is a, another can of worms, um, and that is uh, like transsexuality. So we talked about homosexuality quite a bit last week, and I think we kind of addressed all the major concerns there. But obviously, that doesn't make it easy, of course. Um, if somebody that you know and love is dealing with these sorts of things. Um, but transsexuality has been a big thing in the last couple of months, societally speaking, right? How many of you are familiar with the Equality Act? So it's, uh, the Equality Act, I would say, is misnamed. Um, it is a bill that just got passed in the House and is, I think, still awaiting to be passed in the Senate, right? Um, and essentially what that bill would do is it would um, label sex discrimination or, or gender orientation discrimination, sorry, um, on the same level as race and sex discrimination. So that means that like if I would refuse to marry a female and then a transsexual male, or yeah, so a female who thinks she's male to another female, that I could be legally penalized for that. Yeah. Right? Um, now, I don't think it's going to play out exactly that way because there are, there are too many people that I think that would affect, but it could. Right? Yeah. Um, and so all the, the drama, the particular situation aside, it is it would behoove us to talk about what exactly the Bible says about this transsexuality. And, and really, the deeper questions are, um, are sex and gender malleable? or not. And what does the scripture say about that? So we're going to turn to pages 102, um, and we're going to talk about question number 77 at the bottom of page 102, going into 103. What is the Christian perspective on persons who are confused about their sexual identity? So 
And by the way, this is this was something I don't know when exactly it was changed, probably early 2000s, um, that was in the uh, what do they call that the DM DSV DSV um, <laughs> where uh, gender it's called gender dysphoria now. I think it was gender identity disorder before. Then it was a, a real it's a real thing that people genuinely go through this, and it's been well documented. And it's been around for much longer than we've been talking about it nationally. Um, but there are there are signs that it's been increased artificially, and there's a lot of argumentation going back and forth about that. But during adolescence, most people come to realize a growing interest and attraction toward the opposite sex, a desire and attraction that God intended when he created us male and female, and established marriage between man and woman. Christians realize that the desire and attraction for the opposite sex is the God-given basis for marriage, for the conception and birth of children, and for the future of earthly human life. Some persons, however, may discover that they are attracted to individuals of the same sex. Others may feel uncomfortable with the sex they were born with and wish they were or believe they are the opposite sex with the wrong body. Such desires result from our fallen nature and are contrary to the will of God. Therefore, we should. Okay, so before we get into the letter answers there, there's something that you have to assume about your creatureliness to think some of these thoughts that the Bible rejects. Okay, so at base level, you have to think that you, when you think of you in an existential sense, in other words, your being is separate from your body. Okay. So in other words, your body is just sort of like this placeholder in, in the created universe for what is you. It's not actually you. Does that make sense? A little bit confusing. Um, so like... <clears throat> Can you describe an apple to me without naming any of its attributes? Right. So the, the argument here is that there's some underlying substance apart from the fact that it's green or red and that it tastes sweet or it smells a certain way or it feels a certain way. Right. And so in order to really get into depth on what you would, the mind space you're in when you're thinking about transsexuality, is that the being that is you is not tied to your body. So like you're what you're saying is that maybe the opposite, what you're thinking is a product of the chemistry that's going on in your physical self, right? Because they're tied, it's all tied together. Well, so when you start getting into the particulars of brain science, for us, it becomes obvious that that isn't true. Mm -hmm. But in order to say that I'm a female trapped in a male's body or a male trapped in a female's body, I have to think that the thing that I'm referring to as me is not related to my body. Because I, I'm taking what is one in our mind and making it two things. I'm making it me as a, as a living thing and my body. Now that comes historically from Greek philosophy where you have a dualism of matter and spirit. Right. And when you, anytime you separate matter and spirit out, what, what do you think is the more important one? Spirit, right? Um, so when you talk about the human body, if somebody is in matter and spirit dualism, the body is just like a housing for the spirit. So when you die, what happens? Your spirit leaves your body, right? That's where that thought comes from. Okay. The scriptures don't really talk about it that way. I mean, the scripture refers to having a soul, so it does refer to that, but it never divorces that soul's identity from your actual created body. And it's actually quite specific in Revelation when it talks about God coming and making all things new, that those are physical things, a new heavens and a new earth, right? And that you're going to be given a new heavenly body. So we're not going to be wisps of spirit cloud floating around with a bunch of little cupid angels flying around with it, right? There's a much more physical aspect to it. Otherwise, why do you think it was necessary that Jesus had to literally become a created man? He wasn't just redeeming the spirit of humans. He was re redeeming the creature that he made, which includes their flesh. It includes all of creation that was corrupted by sin, right? So, so that is it. That's the first, I would say, the most basic point of divergence 
between our understanding of biology and sense of being from those who are in this camp. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who's claiming that they're transsexual thinks about that stuff. They probably don't. But the philosophy that drives this movement rests on those assumptions. Okay. Um, and it's, I wanted to bring that up as well because it's probably one of the more common philosophies that has come into the church throughout the years. The idea that, and, and because of, probably because of the soul language and the scriptures talking about, you know, the, the separation of, of spirit and matter. And the Bible doesn't really do that. Right. So the Bible, in the Bible, your body is an intrinsic part of your identity, which is why. When it talks about the day of judgment, sometimes what does it say is going to happen? It says that that will be raised, right? Um, so if you're talking about the dead being raised, you're typically referring to like an actual physical event like Lazarus, right? Um, so there's this understanding, scripturally speaking, that it isn't just the, the spirit body separation that those are one entity. Okay. okay, letter A. So we would say these are contrary to God's will, these thoughts about I'm a, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body. Um, a, remember that our chief identity is given in baptism, that we are children, children of God, and heirs of heaven, right? Um, so I didn't really think about this until it was pointed out by a seminary professor. What do you do? You walk around going, "I'm a heterosexual male," or I'm, I guess now it's cisgender male. No, you don't, right? Because that's not the central aspect of your identity. You're not defined by your sexuality, right? And that's what point A is making. For a Christian, we're defined primarily by our identity in Christ as children of God. But for those that are really invested in the the sexual liberation movements, what's the first thing you typically learn about them? Their sexuality, right? And that really is the root, in many cases, of their identity. And you can see this in the way our society treats somebody who comes out as being gay. So let's say your friend comes out to you and they're gay. Almost automatically, you have a bunch of other assumptions that you now associate with. Because being gay means you're this sort of person. And that's not just the assumptions you're making in your own head. They've been society, societally established. right? And you can see the way that they're treated by their own camp, so to speak, if they don't fall in line with some of those things. Right? So if I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person who's, who's pro-gay gay rights and pro-gay marriage, and I'm gay myself, and I'm in a gay marriage, but I think that men and women like having a husband and wife and father and mother is a better way to raise children, I'm absolutely eviscerated in the public square. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not so sure that I'm not so sure that I agree with all of that. Because people who are heterosexual, right? Yeah. Christians in particular, because heterosexual, regardless of, of your religious background, right? Yeah. Hate gay people. Oh, well, they, they have a real problem with gay people, yeah. right? And well, you can't deny it. Well, no, but I think, so, right? And I think I've detected this in your comments before, yeah. and yeah. I think you're overly pessimistic about other Christians' I motivations. So. I, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of evidence that, that people, that, that, that homosexuals are treated extra bad, as, as extra bad, right? And I and I think in what sense do you mean that? It's the worst. It's it is the sin. Just we, we, we talked about it before, right? Yeah. People who are Muslim and married, right, and gay people. I mean, it's theologically it's the same thing, except that the the gay part is what people focus on, and they don't focus on the other. Right? Sure. That that's an example of what I'm talking. About, sure, but right? I think the statement that you just made was something different. Well, like gay, you just you every, just made the statement that you think most Christians hate gay people in, in every culture across the, the world, right? Homosexuality is is a very negative thing. 
right? Sure. More so than other things that are equally as bad from a spiritual standpoint, but they're treated poorly. What I'm saying is, I don't think, I think the reason for that is because heterosexuals are defined by their sexual orientation more so than I think you would, than you're saying. Oh, I did, I did not make the statement that heterosexual people are not defined by their sexuality. You're saying that their I'm identity. Typically, they don't, their identity is not as wrapped up in that. I think it is. I just don't think that it's as, it's different. But because they react so poorly, right? Because they're so, they have such a negative, being has a, the, the homosexuality has such a negative connotation, right? And, and is it not supposed to? We've, but in, in, in a special way, they've been accorded a special category of sinfulness and badness. Sure. Because, you know, somebody can be beating their wife and that's bad. But if you're gay, that's the worst, right? right? In, in many respects. I would say that that's no longer true. I think I think what you're saying was true at a certain point when this was becoming much more of a public issue than it had ever been before. But well, the point like, well, let me put it this way: Do you regularly see Christians like verbally or physically assaulting gay people because they're gay? Because that's a, that's an outpouring of actual hatred. Absolutely. That's a question. I don't see that regularly. They do. And they might not be beating them, but they they yeah. verbally verbally abuse them, call them names. They use it. They use things related to homosexuality as a pejorative way of insulting others. Yeah. Right? Calling calling if you call somebody a fag, right, or a homo, or something like that. They may not be homosexual, but you're you're insulting them. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, that stuff is alive and well. I mean, yeah. alive sure, and well. but you you have to be. You have to be uh, discerning in the way that you treat some of that. So, like, if a twelve-year-old makes a gay joke, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily motiv motivated by hatred of gays, right? That could have been something they heard and they thought was funny, or it's something that's been accepted in the group of friends they're in, and it can be even accepted in the group. And I'm not defending that. I'm just saying that, like, it's a pretty far jump to assume that that's always motivated by hatred of those people. It's a reflection of our societal views about homosexuality. And, well, and I, I guess what I'm pushing against is I would say that within my experience in the church, that has changed, I would say, quite significantly in the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. that, 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 I think that response was more common because it was this new public problem that the church did not do a good job of teaching its members on how to deal with, and so their responses were, it's not natural, it's, you know, it's messed up, it's gross, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bible does say it is those things, right? It does say that homosexuality and, and other sexual immoralities are an abomination to God, right? So it's important that, that we don't sort of try and dilute that to the point where it's not seen as a negative, because it should be, mm -hmm. right? But we have to make sure that we're careful to distinguish the condemnation of the sin and not the, the person that's involved in that. My brother had a similar situation where he was asked by one of his friends uh, who's gay. My, my brother and his wife are, are very social people and they're very uh, engaging and loving of those that they're friends with. So they have a lot of friends from all different types of beliefs and backgrounds. And one of his good friends was getting married and he's gay. And he asked him if he would if he would be in his wedding party and my brother and I, he called me and talked about it and I encouraged him to write him a letter expressing you know, his, his sentiment. And he chose to reject to participate because he felt that, and he, and he did it in a very loving and gracious way. And the response from his friend was very good. Um, and in that situation, obviously his friend was probably a little hurt, but not in a judgmental sort of sense, but from his perspective, he was just asking my brother to participate. Um, in the case that you're talking about, I would say it's going a little further <laughs> because you're actively making something happen that we would believe is ultimately detrimental to those two, right? So the, the question, and, and this is where it gets really difficult because we, we are called to still love and support them, right? And so, like if the example is they've invited us over for dinner, should we go? The answer was yeah. Well, they're they're 
they're struggling with a sin like you're struggling with other sins. Like there's no reason for you to shun them or reject them. You should still love them and, and have a good relationship with them and foster that relationship. But then if it moves into the realm of like active support of unrepentant behavior that we believe is ultimately detrimental to them, it's not detrimental to me. Like it, it doesn't affect my spiritual well-being if somebody gets married in a homosexual relationship. But part of the love that I'm called to in Christ is the same sort of love he had for me, right? He interceded when he saw that I was behaving in ways that led away from him. And so we're called to interpret these sorts of things in that same way, which is why the distinction, and we talked about this last week, is not but like the particular sin, as Mike is rightly pointing out. It's the state of unrepentance. So are you celebrating and glorifying something that God calls not good? If that's the case and you want me to participate in it, whether it's about homosexuality or lying or cheating or even heterosexual things. Because I, I can tell you, I've been to a wedding, my best friend growing up, his family kind of fell away from the church and he invited me to his wedding. And I was kind of guilty. I felt guilty of having gone. And it wasn't for a homosexual relationship, but it was just, I felt like they were just sort of thumbing their nose at God related to the sin. And that would be an example of a similar sort of thing where like my participation was sort of an act of encouragement, especially because we had such a close relationship to sort of treat something God intended for another purpose in your own way, which is bad. Um, so and that's where I, I don't like making blanket statements on ways to treat individual situations because they all have different details. So if they're just asking you to go and, and participate, like as a, just an observer, you know, that's also a difficult question. You know, so let's see what time is it? Oh, it's, it's noon. <laughs> okay. Um, great questions. I think, was there one other person that had their hand up? Was it you, Rob? Okay. Um, so to just sort of summarize that discussion, we're called to love in a way that is going to be countercultural, particularly on issues like this, especially right now. Right? This is this is on people's minds. And just because someone accuses you of being unloving does not mean it's true. Okay, especially if they come they're coming from a completely different system of belief. So we're called on the authority of scripture to do our best to prayerfully decipher what is the faithful and right thing, not only for me, but for the person in question in these sorts of situations, which automatically means you're going to be in the mess of it and the relationships with the people. Cause right. We talked about, you can't just cut them off and shut them. That's not the response we're supposed to have either. Um, so my encouragement to you is when you encounter those situations, I, I would be more than happy to talk to you about them. And it would always be confidential, of course. But like anytime I'm I'm addressing a question or a concern that is something that I'm not quite sure about, I have four or five people that I trust and I think are wise and I call and talk to. So I encourage you to do that in those situations. Uh, because while it's easy in the classroom to say, by the book, this is wrong, people make things messy, right? Ourselves included in that. I'm not saying other people, I'm saying people, period. And so each situation deserves its own diligence and discussion and prayerful consideration. But the clear teaching when it comes to like homosexuality in this from scripture is that it is a sin. So knowing that it is a sin and that God is a God of love and wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, our task is to use what we know from the scriptures to navigate those situations. Okay, that's all we got time for today. We actually made it through the, the points I wanted to talk about. Um, if there's anything else that you wish to bring up related to this topic uh, next week, please do write it down and bring it up. And we'll certainly give it the time it needs. Let's close with a word. Dear Heavenly Father, you know, when we start talking about sins and dealing with particular types of sins and the situations that come up, it just makes us even more thankful for the depth of the mercy you've shown us in Jesus. That when we try to do our best in these situations, we're probably going to screw up in one way or another. And for that, we ask for your forgiveness.
But we also ask that you give us wisdom and guidance to see what is the best course of action in accordance with your will, not only for our well-being, but for those that we're serving and in relationship with. With the ultimate goal always being that they come to know you, the ultimate deliverer and healer of their souls. As we learned today in our gospel reading, God loved the world, so he sent you. And that by having faith in you, which is a gift given by the Holy Spirit, we have life in your name forever. Be with us as we endeavor to bring that wondrous news to all of those in our lives. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Have a great week, everyone.